leadership is somebody who is lead, who is to show the pathway for others to follow, who is to be the arrowhead and others follow behind. So once he is lost, then the whole group behind him get lost. Once he is destroyed, then the other behind him get disorganized. So that is why it is very important that you, uh, to be a very effective uh, leader, you must be a leader also wants to empower those following you. Um, I've always looked at this as if it's a game uh, in, of soccer in Africa. You know, soccer is very popular in Africa. You will find every good coach, one, he tries to build his team, and then he has substitution on the bench. To substitute if one player is injured, or if he wants to change the pattern of play, he has key people doing certain things for the success of the team. So that's what I also see leadership. The leader can be as a coach who brings together individuals with different experiences, different strengths and weaknesses, merge them together, put them together to complement each other's effort for the success of the overall uh, success of the team. And for a country, that is what should be for the success, for the progress and the development of that nation. I Google leadership and I found I have over 800 million responses of leadership. And as I, some said, there are as many definitions of a leader as there are leaders. So, but there are basic things that you need to have. You, a leader must have a vision for the organization. And he must be able to sell it well for the people following him to buy in. Because when you do not buy in and you do not get people to accept what you are doing, then you will find out that um, you cannot legislate leadership. You cannot compel people. You may quack them, but they will not get the best. But when you are able to influence people and they accept and buy in, in what you are doing, then you will find out they will willingly support you, they will willingly follow you, and you will find with ease your organization will be on top. When we were in, uh, in my last assignment in the military, as a force commander in Sudan. We had a lot of challenges with the Sudanese government, with the Sudanese rebels. And I sat with my officers from different countries. Uh, we have major contingent. We, have about, we had 18 countries, but with staff officers, uh, military observers and everything, we have a total of 58 countries in the mission. So. As the force commander, you are dealing with officers and men and women from 50-something countries in the world. So you must, first of all, be able to make them understand what you are doing. And then you must also make sure they understand why it is important for them to do what they are doing for the overall benefit of the mission. For example, if you want to help the local people get food, get water, you now tell this contingent that I will want you to patrol this route to make sure there's no threat or anything so that the humanitarian organization that are bringing food, medicine, and every other humanitarian aid to the people
can go freely on that route and come to supply these people uh, the basic necessities of, for their lives. If they don't do it, these people will go without water. If they don't do it, these people will go without food. So you discuss with them. And uh, sometimes either the rebel, uh, the movement, sorry, you know, I, they don't like that word, rebel. The movement or the government will say, no, you peacekeepers, you can't go this, this. And then I will discuss, and I, I will come to an agreement that we are not here to fight anybody. So if we have a mission, we are going to point A and you stop us, we will not fight you, but we will not turn back. We will stay there. And when we stay there for two, three, four hours, you have a challenge. And then we also want to tell the world, we didn't bring ourselves. There is a mandate that your country accepted us to come to perform a peacekeeping mission in this country. You are now stopping us to achieving our mandate. And uh, that tried to start turn, changing around things. That chart showing, oh, well, what would our minister feel? What would the army commander feel? What would the Ministry of Defense feel that we have done this? So we start dialoguing together. And uh, you will find out that we're, with that, we're able to influence what we're doing. And then we're able to help the people. And they then saw the mission as a force for good that is helping them to get their regular supply of what they require. So you just find out that it was a simple thing without necessarily going to a major fight. We're still able to provide the mission, the people that were there to help, provide them the means of their livelihood. So that is uh, one uh, at, at, at home in Nigeria, uh, so many things happened when I was uh, uh, chief of army staff. Um, one example, I have, when I got in, I found out that Nigeria had been involved in peacekeeping since our independence in 1960. We have institutions that take care of the officers. But how about the soldiers? the young men and women who are actually the ex who execute these orders every day. For example, patrolling. Patrolling is done by the soldiers. Um, take issue of cordon and such. It's not officers that do the cordon and such. It's the soldiers. And I found out that in Nigeria, we have not had a, a strong institution that trained these soldiers to perform that role. So I did, when I got back, when I had the opportunity of becoming chief of minister, I discussed it with my officers, and then we approached the our some of our partners, like UK and US in particular. UK was very forthcoming. So with the assistance from UK, we were able to build a uh, training uh, center. Today, we have a peacekeeping center in Kaduna with the assistance of the UK. And then the US came in to join with the Akota program to train our soldiers in preparing them before they go to any mission. And they had more of a realistic, practical training of what they will do similar to what they will do in their missions. And it was very clear to us, we started seeing them performing better. We started seeing uh, the image of our country coming back higher. But the other interesting aspect is that all those skills that you need in peacekeeping are the same skills you need in internal security at home. Because it's your people, you must use minimum force, you must maybe make sure you you know that you are there to win the hearts and the minds of the people. So we found very quickly that the peacekeeping center helped us in two ways. It helped us in training our soldiers 
that are going abroad for peacekeeping. It helps us in training our soldiers for internal security, for counter insurgency and other things at home. And that is it was a win-win situation both ways. That is very Remember that as a military officer and also any officer in a security sector uh, environment, we have some time to take hard decisions, especially if there are going to be interferences by the executive arm of government or by the legislative arm of government, by politicians who want one favor or the other, or who want you to uh, take some action that could give them some political advantages, especially during campaigning and during election. Those are very challenging. Or they will want you to favor somebody from their own ethnic group or one of their friends to be in a position because once he is there, that the motivation there is not to serve. The motivation there is to be able to do his bidding or their bidding when he gets to that place. Those are the challenges. But if you as a leader think of one thing, mentoring, that you are prepared to mentor those behind you, that you are prepared to train, mentor, and prepare the next generation of leaders, then you will find out you will do a lot of work to identify who are those potential leaders. Who are, who are those who have the flair for leadership? You don't have to go out publicly to announce, but you have identified them, and you start preparing them for leadership. You expose them to challenging uh, situations. You expose them to decision-making. They understand how decisions are being made. You expose them to real having challenges, uh, pressures like the one you have, um, you have just mentioned, a politician or a political party wants something for their advantage, especially if they are the ruling party, and you know that that is wrong. You have to have that moral courage to say no. And what does it? Uh, I will always submit that two things are crucial in leadership. A lot of them are crucial. Character is important. But communication and integrity, they are most important things. The integrity of doing what you ought to do as a leader, not what you want to do as a leader, is very important. The ability to communicate, to know your subordinates and communicate to them exactly what you want them to do so that they understand and tell them the, and let them know the importance why you want them to do it. For example, I told you about patrolling a route. If you ask those soldiers to patrol that route, they do, if, you, they, if they know why they have to do it, then it may even make them more to work harder. That if they don't patrol, this group of people sitting here may not get food. They may not get water. They may not get any humanitarian assistance. But if they patrol and secure that route, the convoy can bring these people food, it can bring them water, then they will not say, oh, so the lives of these people depend on me or on us. Then they will do the best. So in uh, the same thing, you must make your subordinates know why you are asking them to do that thing and let them know why, why, is, import, why, why is it important that this little role that you're asking them to play is so crucial to the overall success of the whole thing. You the leader. How do I perceive myself? Look at the look, mirror yourself 
and uh, and say am I deficient in this area, that area, or this? If you have peers that you have confidence in, do peer rating. Ask your peers to tell you how do they rate you, how do they see you, what are your strong points, what are your weaknesses. You can even ask your subordinates. Not a conference, just in discussion. Ask your subordinate, how do you think about this? Oh no, sir. I think, oh, what do you think people in this place talk about me? Oh, you are, they say you are so good in this area. This is what I've heard. But in this area, I think they say, no, 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 you are not. So you start assessing yourself. Then make sure that you guide against those who are weaknesses. Because we are human. Every one of us has a strong point and his weak point. As a leader, especially in the security sector, a lot is expected out of you. Whether you are in the custom, people will look at uh, how much are you allowing contribution to be brought into the country? How much revenue is the government losing in that area? Uh, if you are a policeman, how many, how many even simple uh, traffic, breaking of traffic rules and regulation? How many do you allow people to get away with it? And what would you have done if you have done it better? So, when you start with yourself, then after knowing your weaknesses, you work on them, you should also improve on yourself. You are reading, even if you are not going on training, you should do something to improve yourself, to be up to date in what is happening in the development in your field and in other related areas around you. Once you are able to do that, then you will be able to look more of your subordinates and see where their difficulties are. And it is most important is to expose your, encourage your subordinates to also do what I'm saying, assess themselves, uh, improve themselves. But you also should give them opportunity to train them, to improve them through conferences, through local training within yourself, through simulating exercises and everything to improve them. And after you have done all this, I also important uh, good communication, uh, give them a feedback. Delegate authority. That gives people confidence. Okay, you are my number two. I am, if I'm away, what happens? If I've never delegated an authority to you, you will make mistakes, but where people learn most is in this world is there from their mistakes. A good leader will learn most from his mistake and he will stick to his head forever. So delegate to your subordinates, give them time to develop, have confidence in themselves, give them a feedback. The last time I gave you this, oh, this was very good, you did this very well, and this. No, this area you need, you shouldn't have done it this way. But I'm doing it this way. You see, you are mentoring the person. You are giving the person some confidence so that tomorrow, even if you have and you are not there or you, are, you have to leave, and God forbid, we will die one day. If you are not there, there is somebody who is readily available to feel that. So, knowing yourself, knowing your weaknesses and your strong points, Passing to your subordinates to know themselves, know their weaknesses and their strong point. Delegate authority to them, not abdicating your responsibility, but delegating responsibility to them. And when people have done good, reward them, recognize them. That gives them confidence in what they are doing. Where they have done something bad, admonish and sanction them. When they have done something good, reward them and recognize them. And then you will find out that that organization will be a living organism every day. Uh, remember I talked about the shark in the accordion. That is it. If you put a shark in the accordion, it will never grow. But if you remove it from the accordion and put it in the sea, it will become 50 feet big uh, shark. But in the accordion, it may not even get even to become uh, 5 feet will stay there because there is no room to grow. But if you allow your organization to grow, you will find out that in a short time, 
who have all sharks grown and the organization become very lively. 